Thanks, Kayla. Thanks, Katie. Well, it's good to be back in the Scottsbluff area. I cut my teeth uh, on the geology of Nebraska in the Panhandle and the Sandhills in the Niobrara River Valley, but I think it's a close tie between the Sandhills and, and the Wildcat Ridge in terms of where my heart really lies of geology in the state. So I was a public servant with the state of Nebraska through the Conservation and Survey Division lovingly called the constipation and scurvy division by those of us that knew, but you know, we were the state geologic survey and I was hired to come here and to look at the ancient rivers, how they related to the groundwater, because groundwater is the heart of the state, as you well know. So I was, I was brought here to under, try to understand the buried river systems. Well, in doing that, I also looked at a whole lot of other things I had no idea were in Nebraska, like a lot of rocks that were deposited primarily because of volcanoes that were erupting way to the west. <clears throat> and we're gonna look at some of that tonight. Fortunately, Scottsdale Monument is a beautiful place to see those. <clears throat> then we're gonna see a film that's talking, that's uh, Dante's Peak, that's really a, a takeoff from Mount St. Helens eruption. Now the volcanoes I'm gonna talk about that relate to the monument are much, much larger and much more, um, put out a lot more volcanic debris, a lot more energetic than the volcano that's gonna be in the movie. But it's a good thing because you don't wanna see one of those calderas go off in your lifetime, all right? It's the, it's the kind of ones that led to the destruction of Yellowstone, okay? So um, I'm gonna walk you through the geology of the monument, pointing out, um, where, where the volcanic ash beds are and how, how that impacts the overall uh, lay of the land. And then um, give you some caveats about the movie. It is a movie after all, it's not a documentary. There are some pretty good documentaries about volcanoes. This is, a pretty, this is one of the best movies about a volcano. They get most of the science right and the scientists get pretty picky sometimes when you're dealing in our territory and you're gonna, you can't do that, that isn't how it happens. Well, sorry, it's for a movie, you know, it's a movie, folks. I will then, I will let you know a few things that they really got wrong, some of which you will be able to figure out yourself, some of which are a little more arcane. So, if we could have the first slide, I will, um, we'll look at this, okay, so, Beautiful face of Scottsbluff Monument. We're gonna, we're gonna go up the lower part. You can see the color change uh, on this, not quite, but it's grayer, grayer up above here and browner down below, okay? That's, the lower unit is called the White River Group of Sediments. There's several different rock formations in that. And the upper part of the monument is part of the Arikari Group. There's several more formations there. Not all the formations of the White River Group and Arikari Group are present in this part of the monument. There are some missing parts to the section, but we'll talk about that uh, later. All right, so this is looking down from the top and we're gonna scroll through. Again, the White River Group, this is the, the color now is quite obvious below that zone. We're into these buff, they're not really pinkish, but they're, you know, they're finer grained and the rocks above of the Rickery group are a little bit, they're sandier and they're grayer, okay? So that's the first, that's pretty easy geology. Well, heck, if, it's, if, if geology's that easy, why are they paying you the big bucks to do the rocks, you know? Well, okay, it turns out it's a little harder than just that part, it's more than colors. So I'm gonna then point out some of the volcanic ash beds. These are layers that directly fell out of the sky from volcanoes erupting anywhere from 500 to 700 miles to the west and landed on the landscape that was being created here. The first one you can see here is the largest one. This is the, what we call the Lower Whitney Volcanic Ash or Tuff is the, the technical term. And we have a whole bunch more here. Here's the Upper Whitney Ash. They're about 100 feet apart. And then we have smaller, thinner ashes, not quite as extensive in parts of the Rickery group. Okay, this one down below, this is, this is the large, this is related to an eruption that's one of the largest known ever in the history of the planet. 
That sounds big, and it is, okay? And I hope I can maybe give you some reasons why that's the case, all right? So this is, this not isn't great a focus. This is a, what a geologist calls a stratigraphic section of the rocks on the monument, starting with the, the contact between the White River group, the Brule Formation, there's that upper Whitney Ash, and this is mostly the Arikari group with two formations, Gehring and then a combined Monroe Creek and Harrison. The Gehring on the monument is mostly thin bedded, very fine grained sand. We're missing a part of the Gehring that has pumice pebbles in it. Pumice pebbles that didn't fall from the sky that, but that were transported down in streams from a volcano in the never summer range of Colorado. <clears throat> and pumice in here has been dated at 28 million, but we don't see it here. We have to go to other parts of the Walcat Ridge to find it. This upper ash has a date of about 30 million years, okay? So all the little V's here, there's a whole number. We, so there's more volcanic ash beds shown on here than were shown on the, on the, on the, on the photograph. <clears throat> So if you come on the, on the hike on Saturday, we will see a lot of gory details. You can see it's not quite as straightforward. There's lots of things going on within this uh, rickery unit. There's, there's actually um, other volcanic ash beds and lenses there. These are windblown small aeolian dunes. And if you come on the trip, I'll show you how we know that they were deposited by the wind rather than by water. We also have in this part of, of this really thin bedded Gehring formation, there are many tracks of some of the animals that lived here 28 to 25 million years ago. We don't find their bones in here, we find their tracks, okay? There's some of the big, the kind of pig-like entelodonts and probably a bunch of different camels too. We also have, um, um, gypsum crystals in here, that, because this is a fairly arid, uh, arid environment. This is probably a Playa Lake kind of thing. All right? So here's a more famous locality, at least in some ways, that has a great, there's the white of the lower Whitney Tuff or lower Whitney ash bed. This is the one associated with what's called the Windus Butte Tuff, and I'll show you a map in, in a little bit as to where that ash came from. All right, so understand, first of all, that this entire White River group is made up of volcanic debris. Only about 10% is not volcanic debris. But we don't call it an ash because geologists have got a little picky about it, even though we should. It really is a tuff because it's anything more than 50% volcanic material is supposed to be a tuff if it fell out of the air. Well, this is like a lust. This is windblown silt, but it got mixed in with some other stuff. Whereas this white bed is the direct air fall material from the big eruption in Nevada, Utah that fell down out of the sky. And it fell onto a really flat landscape. We have, we can find this ash bed in thousands of test holes that we've drilled and thousands of oil and gas wells. It's a wonderful marker and it's flat. Now, it, it conforms to the topography. So it was pretty boring. Not that, I mean, it's more bore, a lot more boring than Scotts Bluff is today in terms of topography, okay? And Scotts Bluff is not a boring topographic place. Okay, so that's the famous one over at Chimney Rock, uh, outcrop of it. This is looking inside, I've taken my machete and my, my trowel and I've trimmed, I've scraped off the lower Whitney ash, which is a total of about eight feet to 10 feet at, at the, at the uh, Chimney Rock area. And you see all these things here? Whoops, I went, let's go back here, hang on folks. That was not supposed to happen, hang on. All right, okay. You see these, see the tubes running out of here? See the tubes here, see these big, there's different tubes? What do these look like to you? I'm asking as lay people, what, what you might, you're seeing cross sections. These are spheres, all right? There's a, that's a, about four inches there. So these, the spheres here are maybe two inches across. 
Have you ever looked at ant colonies in a cross section or termites in a cross section? We're pretty certain that these are social insect burrows. For some reason, they loved the lower Whitney ash. I don't think there was food in it, but it was an easier thing to burrow into. And there are, there are just, it's nothing but burrows of social insects. There's also other burrows of, of wasps that backfill their, their burrows. Just replete. They really loved, they were really grateful for that ash out here. I'm sure the other animals running around, you know, in 10 feet of volcanic ash weren't too excited about it. You know, that was not the best day for them. Even though we don't see any evidence for great die-offs. There's no big extinctions that we can tell in the fossil record. Okay? So, the eruptions that produced these individual ash beds and then the general overall ash material that makes up the White River group and a good bit of the Rickery group came out of not stratovolcanoes like you're going to see in Dante's Peak, but these giant caldera eruptions that are ringed. They're anywhere from 15 to 30 miles across, all right? That's not a small part of the landscape. And huge magna plumes below that once they release the initial thing, collapse and sink in and make giant calderas. And th these can produce eruptions in the terms of thousands of cubic miles to hundreds of cubic miles. Mount St. Helens was less than one cubic mile. Mount Pinatubo was maybe three cubic miles. The eruption that produced the lower Whitney Tuff was 500 cubic, 5,000 cubic miles. That, I don't, that, I just can't deal with that. That's way too much, okay? That's way too much stuff. But they come out as ring collapses. The whole thing comes out in these ring fractures and giant eruptions pour out of this and pyroclastic clouds that I'll explain later, pyroclastic, flow down the edge. These eruptions probably took years to build up and ramp up and to start so you wouldn't, if Yellowstone caldera is, a, is, is one of these, okay? So how much time would we have if Yellowstone decided to erupt? It's been 620,000 years since the last major Yellowstone eruption that destroyed everything all around the Yellowstone area. We would have months and months and months because they're really huge and they take a long time to build up. It's not like Mount St. Helens or Dante's Peak. It only takes a few months or a few weeks, all right? But they spread this debris tremendous distances. And there was a time between about 38 million and 28 million, with 30 million centered, that we call the giant caldera eruptions in, in the west. Notice this, this is the coastline 30 million years ago. California is sitting out here. This, so with the, the, between Nebraska over here and the coast has been foreshortened about 70 to 120 miles. The giant caldera areas are the Cascades, the Great Basin, and the Great Basin is the source of most of what we see in the White River Group of Nebraska. These are the, at least eight different calderas, huge, huge. Then we have a whole set in central Colorado in the south. Those are a little bit, a little bit younger. Then there's a whole set of eruptions down here in the Sierra Madre in Mexico and, and southern uh, Arizona and Utah. But our main, our main interest is these guys and these guys. And they spread stuff out here. And so here's, there's the White River group of sediments spread across Nebraska, parts of North, uh, up to North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. That's where the White River group is. It's been eroded out of here. Those ash beds from these eruptions were, were out here, but they got, they got eroded. So here's, here's the sequence. We have this giant caldera eruption. It sends clouds of ash, hundreds of, I mean, thou, tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 feet into the air, carried downwind mostly to the east. A lot of the ash that drops out here, let's say in, in, in Wyoming, then gets picked up by the wind and gets redeposited. So Nebraska can get up to 10 to 12, 15 feet from some of these caldera eruptions. Crazy. These are not full of sulfur. It's the sulfur containing eruptions like Mount Pinatubo that really cause major climatic problems. These are full of silica. 
It's just silica rich, and they don't seem to put up sulfate particles into the atmosphere. So we don't get quite as big a climatic effects from these eruptions. We've never been able to see a major climatic change uh, in the White River Group because of these eruptions. So there's the ash fall in the Great Plains. So a little bit about stratovolcanoes. So this is Dante's Peak. This is Mount St. Helens. This is Mount Pinatubo, El Chichon in Mexico. All the major eruptions in your lifetime have been from these kind of eruptions. Non-Hawaiian, so we're not the big shield volcanoes. These are volcanoes that produce some lava flows, but mostly they're pyroclastic ash clouds and mud flows called lahars. Okay, a Filipino word, lahar. And so they can put, they, they're not, they're still not tiny. I mean, Mount St. Helens was impressive, you know, and so was Pinatubo even better. And Dante's Peak is too, all right? So you get these giant eruption clouds and coming down the side, oh, I, there's a, one of the classic, I like to see Mount St. Helens in black and white because I was there a week after the eruption the big eruption, there were still small eruptions, and it was a gritty landscape. So I kind of envisioned Mount St. Helens more in black and white than in beautiful color, okay? That's just me. So that's at the full-blown start of the Plinian eruption. Okay, this is the dude, the ignimbrites, these glowing ash clouds. These are the ones that do major damage. They're the ones that have, that that took out Pompeii, all right, when Vesuvius went, it was these successive glowing ash clouds, pyroclastic flow, along with the mud flows, the lahars, those two things do most of the damage and life problems. These come down the sides of the volcano, moving in anywhere from 80 to 120 miles an hour at temperatures from 1500 degrees Fahrenheit to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Have you ever played air hockey? Anybody played air hockey? I have, you know. You get that disc on a little cushion of, of air. Well, what's driving these things down here is a cushion of hot gases being exuded from these small pumice pebbles. So it's like playing air hockey, but you put it on a slope that's 15 degrees, 20 degrees. No wonder you can get up to 120 miles an hour. And then you throw in the superheated gases in front of these. Even some of these only leave deposits that there are maybe but they can kill you just as fast, okay? And so we'll look at inside it, there's a whole mixture of these volcanic glass shards. This is blown up, so there's, there's 100 microns. So they're pretty tiny, but they're really sharp and angular. You, you breathe that stuff in, you're not gonna like yourself for a while, because you're, you're gonna get sick and you could die. But mostly in the, in the pumice, in the ignimbrites, the glowing ash clouds, the it's made from frothy masses of this pumice that's magma that's cooled instantly and it's turned to glass, but it's full of bubbles. And you heat those up to 2,000 degrees and then put them on at 120 miles an hour and you better not be in front of it, okay? Not good. Okay, so that brings us to Dante's Peak. How are we doing on time? Two minutes left, okay. Before we go to question A. So, Dante's Peak is going to be, it's one of these big stratovolcanoes, it's, like I said, it's, a, it's not a documentary movie, but it's really pretty good science. I'm going to put out three things that I'll say are really where the science, they went left, right? It's a movie, you got to say to yourself, all right? And then I'm going to be up, during the movie, I'm going to be up there with the microphone, and every now and then I'm going to make some sarcastic, snide, smart-ass comment <laughs> about what's going on, okay, okay? But I'm gonna first tell you three things, that two, one of which you would guess, you would get right away, okay. How many of you in this room, raise your hand, would drive a pickup truck across a basalt lava flow with hot flowing magma, all right? How many of you would do that? Nobody would, all right? There's a geologist in here who takes a forest service pickup across a active, hot, 2,000 degree, basalt flow, and his truck does not blow up. <laughs> because you can't kill the kids and the dog too early in the movie, all right? <laughs> all right, so you all would know you wouldn't drive your truck across that, all right? Doesn't matter, there shouldn't be a lava flow on that volcano anyway, but that's okay. All right, 
the second big thing is that there's a giant earthquake that sets off the, the, the first, the big erup the, not the big eruption, but the first of the eruptions. That earthquake is way too big. It's great special effects. Most of the special effects, by the way, were made with models. They didn't computer graphic. They made scale models. It's really well done cinematography when you realize how much of it is done with models. But the earthquake is probably a magnitude seven. Terrible destruction, buildings falling down everywhere. Nah, way too big. The biggest earthquake that was around Mount St. Helens was a five. Around Mount Pinatubo was a five, six. So you don't get sixes, you don't destroy an entire town, okay? The third one. At the very end, I'm not gonna give away everything here, but there's a chase between a pyro, glowing pyroclastic cloud of ash coming down the mountain at 100 miles an hour, temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, blowing away trees and buildings. You'll see a semi blown away completely. But the truck makes it through, okay? <laughs> and nobody even gets sweaty in the truck. You watch the lava float across the lava. They don't get sweaty in the lava float going across the lava flow either. So they could have at least squirted a little water in their faces anyway. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to questions. Just knowing that I will be in the back making snide comments during the movie. I'll try to keep it minimum, but I, I tend to get carried away sometimes if I don't mind. Okay. So a quick thank you to uh, Dr. Swinehart. And then uh, we'll send Kayla around with the microphone. And this is being recorded, so when you ask a question, please do talk into the mic. So you can ask a question about everything from geology to, you know, do I believe in God? That's okay. I'm, I'm prepared for that. Uh, or about uh, Dante's Peak or uh, other volcanoes you've been to. You got a burning question about volcanoes? <laughs> right? One over there. And while I'm walking over there, I just wanted to say thank you to the Midwest Theater and Katie and Billy and the Friends of the Midwest Theater for involving Scotts Bluff National Monument into this program, the science on screen. Uh, we are really excited to be involved. All right, what is your question, sir? Speak into the mic. Yes, hello. I'd like to thank them, too. Um, so on the lower White River um, sediments that you have there, mm -hmm. um, right now it's about 10 feet thick of oh, the the volcanic ash yes yes it's it's yeah 10 what, feet more or less right it what varies. kind of compression did have we gotten when it first okay. fell was it 50 feet or no 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 the fact that we're pretty certain that those social insect burrows came in quite soon afterwards then they're not compressed much so I don't think there's been it's not like a it's not like a bed of peat that you compress 10 times to get you know a 10 feet of peat makes one feet of coal. I don't think there's been that much. It's, it's, it's fairly unconsolidated, and uh, you can scrape it with a trowel or a machete. So I don't think there's been a lot of compaction. Uh, I mean, it, it's, been, it's been minimal, all right? So I think what we see is what we got, okay? Good question, though. All right, we have a question here. What is your question? How did the ashes get exposed on Chimney Rock? Okay, good question. Chimney Rock and Scottswolf Monument itself, in fact, all around Wildcat Hills, when you see the ash beds, they're from erosion, at least during the last two million years. Erosion that, that when all these, uh, let's, let's go, let's do this. Let's, okay, let's go back. Okay. Um, so when these rock layers used to be continuous, right, across the valley, they, there, wasn't, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a drainage there, right? The plat hadn't come through yet. Um, all the other creeks in the area. So it's been in the last couple million years, my, primarily, maybe you have to push it out to maybe the last four, that the erosion has really started working and cutting down the, the river, the plat, the ancestral plat river, started carrying away sediment, rain, landslides, slope wash, and carving out. And what you're seeing, Chimney Rock, somebody had to be last in the room, right? Chimney Rock's just the survivor there because it's, it's there. Somebody had to be, be that way. Okay, good question. Got any more? There's one, one over here. 
Do 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 do. What would have been the water sources at that time? Would there have been overlying water on the land? And how would, how would animals or living things survive? Okay, good question. For most of, let me, let me, let me go back. Uh, let's see, let me, uh, I was gonna get back to where the monument is. Okay, for most of the time during this upper part of the White River Group, it was pretty dry and fairly arid, but there would be local water holes. We don't find a whole lot of fossils in that upper part of the White River Group. They're pretty rare and far between. Once we get into the rickery, a little more water. Still pretty dry. In some places there, though, we do have river valleys that were carrying coarser material, and so we know water was flowing through, but it was not a lush forest land. And this is before the grasslands really evolved. We had some grasses, but not many. But parts of the landscape would have some water flowing over it. But during most of this, the brule formation in between the, the Whitney ashes, it was probably slim pickings, okay? So, okay, that answer it? Okay. So the Arikari group seems to be a little more consolidated. Is that just calcium carbonate cementation? Because it's not metamorphic, right? What no, no, no. It's, a, it's deposited, again, the, most of the Arikari that we're going to see at the monument on the trail and what, what we see here, this very top, this very top of Chimney Rock, some of that is, is, is windblown deposits of small dunes and some are small river deposits. It's fairly unconsolidated. If you were to talk to most geologists that work with hard rocks, they would say, this stuff, all you need is a shovel. You don't need a rock hammer. Now, it gets consolidated through groundwater. There's some concretions that form under groundwater. But for the most part, the rock's not that hard. I never had to have a rock hammer most of the time except to break a concretion open. I used a shovel, all right? So it's still fairly loosely consolidated. It's still, you know, quite a little bit of a rock. But most of it, most of the rickery still is from volcanoes that fell out. It got reworked a number of times. It got picked up and blown around again and blown around again. So we do have some direct airfall, some volcanic airfall in, in the rickery group. And that's where, we get our radio, that's where we get our radiometric dates. Plus from the pumice that got brought in from the Never Summer Range in Colorado. So, okay. And a question in the back there? Yes. How do scientists predict volcanic eruptions such as Yellowstone? Uh, Yellowstone's, a, nobody's ever predicted Yellowstone because the last eruption any size of Yellowstone is, was a minimum 70,000 years ago. So we don't have any practice with that. But for the stratovolcanoes like Mount St. Helens, Mount Pinatubo, Mount St. Helens was a great learning ground. That, that volcano was instrumented to the teeth, all right, before it went up in 1980. The Cascade Range is pretty well instrumented, but they really did a good job with Mount St. Helens. And it blew up in the daytime, in the morning. Lots of photography. There are people in airplanes that photographed. So we learned, geologists learned tremendous amount about what to look for, for pending eruptions. They looked at the different types of tremors produced by earthquakes way deep down versus earthquakes produced by magma moving up the throat of the volcano. That's the term harmonic tremor. They learned how to recognize those. We looked a lot at the different gases given off as, as newer magma came up the throat of the volcano. And they used that information to do a much better job at predicting and saving lives at Mount Pinatubo. We were really lucky that Mount St. Helens went off when it did and didn't wait another two months because the pressure, just like you'll see in the movie, the pressure to not, you know, to say, well, it's just going to pick up a bit, there's going to be some ash, but it's not going to do anything big. The pressure, if that would have happened at Mount St. Helens and it had stayed kind of just quasi-active with these little burps for another two months, there would have been a lot more logging in, the tourist industry would have picked up again, and rather than 64 deaths, there would have been, I would guess, 1,500. So Mount St. Helens was a great training ground for, uh, for volcanologists to learn what do we look for 
these. So now we, we know better ways to instrument the volcanoes. Okay, so it, it turned out to really be worth it in terms of the science. Mm -hmm.